Coming up, we are talking to Rodney and Dr. Karen about the longevity of your dog and how to achieve it. Of course, Winnie is so excited because she said she wants to be here forever with me. <laughs> Talk to you soon, Winnie. Yeah. See you soon. Yeah, see you soon, Winnie. And don't forget to subscribe. Tell them, see, don't forget to subscribe. Look at that grin. <laughs> she is such a ham, this dog. Guys, you don't want to miss. We are learning so much from these two. Thank you so much, you guys. Well, thank we love you. you. This yeah. is awesome. You're so our first you're our you. first interview since being number one New York Times bestseller, oh, which is yay. new to us. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day. Today, we're going to be getting better in the canine world. That's why wow. we have little Vincenza here with us. <laughs> Featured today. This little biatch. Uh, is here today because she's got lots of questions for our guests. Yes. Uh, let's start with our quote of the day. Until one has loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened. Anatole France. I think that is so true. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents used to, you know, no dogs in the house. And when you have your own house, Maria, do whatever you want. So I ended up with like five dogs instantly when I moved to L.A. <laughs> because um, I just, you know, that's just me. I love animals. My parents love animals too. Yeah. And they grew up in villages in Greece and they had baby goats. They were kind of like dogs and donkeys and chickens. And my mom had, you know, a favorite chicken that she later had to kill for dinner. That's a whole oh other story. <laughs> um, yeah. But like you, for example, had no idea no. that you could love a little dog no. the way you love Winnie. No. I am so obsessed with her. I mean, you guys all know this, but <laughs> I grew up with big dogs and, and it's, it's a different love. It is a different it's love. It's a different love. The way she wraps your arm, her little arms around you. That's a poodle thing. She's like a little toddler. Poodles and I love always wrap their arms around. They are toddlers. <laughs> They're children. They're humans. <laughs> I mean, look at her face right now. Yeah. I can't get over it. Yeah. And her stupid little ponytail that's <laughs> coming out. You ragamuffin. You need, you need a grooming, Winnie. Uh, but I know my parents until they got Beethoven didn't, well, I shouldn't say that when they first came to LA and started staying with us extended times, my parents started to see how special our dogs were baby and Benny and Apollo and Noel and, um, and, uh, and Athena, of course, when she came and so they fell in love so fast and then Beethoven came and, my dad would say, and my mom, Maria, we love Beethoven more than you people. Can oh you imagine me? I let a dog kiss me on the mouth. <laughs> they started going bananas. Oh, my God. And so until you have one, it's really hard to understand just how much love is possible. Yeah. I just see that there is just a love that is indescribable with my, my babies that I just want to kill them. I love them so much. Like my heart explodes. <laughs> Kevin has grinded his teeth down multiple times till they cracked. Like he, he'll grit his teeth. Like I love you so much. And he'll crack teeth. Oh my God. He's had to get at least three teeth fixed at the dentist. Stop. I swear. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I feel like I find myself thinking about Winnie. Like when I leave, <laughs> I'm like, is she okay? That's when I knew it was in Connecticut. Mostly I would be, you know, out doing something and I'm like thinking of poor little Winchets at home. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Okay. I'm obsessed. I love her so much. Yeah. She's, she's everything. Max is everything. So I'm super excited for our episode today because today we're chatting with Rodney Habib and Dr. Karen Becker about their recent New York Times bestselling book, The Forever Dog. Um, They're going to give us the proven tools to protect our loyal four-legged companions, help them live longer, help be healthier and happier lives. This book apparently is sold out in 90 seconds. It's number one on the New York Times bestseller list, which is, I, I think, probably a rare thing for a dog book, right? Definitely. But um, it shows you how much we love our animals. The pet industry is just, just a multi-billion dollar massive industry because we treat our dogs better than we treat ourselves. Right. And I think that when we get to the core of everything with them, they're going to tell you guys that diet is the most important thing. Well, guess what? Diet's the most important thing for us too. Yep. So if we can start to love ourselves like we love our dogs, take care of them, take care of us. I think obviously they're here to teach us a lot. 
Um, and that's probably going to be the biggest lesson. We'll see what they say. But um, you know what else I was thinking too, Maria? Well, I was like, this is crazy. Like you said, it's a number one New York Times bestseller dog book, sold out in 90 seconds. The pandemic, I think people really bonded even more Mm -hmm. with their animals, right? And like found a new love and appreciation for them being home with them. And I think like, that's so cool. That was one, I think, positive thing that came out of the pandemic. People are like, I've spent more time with my poor dog who I never spend time with because I'm always at work now that I'm home. Yeah. So now people are like, okay, I want my dog to live till they're 45. Let's go. Yeah, well, it's funny. I did a session with Brian Mahan this morning Mm -hmm. and unrelated but related, he said that, you know, we were talking about who we want to spend our time with and how I'm really, really just over, <laughs> I'm over um, certain relationships and friendships and, and just, I really just want to be around people who are going to have stimulating conversation and I'm going to learn from and grow with and, and have this kind of like beautiful back and forth exchange, right, in, in life. And, and he said, you know, when you would think about it, he's like, how much time do you really have? A third of your life is spent sleeping. You sleep, let's say eight hours a day. The other third is working. He goes, now for you, you don't work average hours. So now you're borrowing from sleep and you're borrowing from personal and you're working so much. He's like, there's just a little sliver basically of you time. So how do you want to spend it? So Amen, Brian. When you think about your dogs, if you were working and sleeping a third and a third, you really only got them for a third. Right. And that third is probably when you're home and now you're stressed because kids are screaming or, you know, the plumber, you know, didn't show up and the plumbing's exploded or whatever. And the dogs are feeling all of the stress, which Rodney and Karen will talk about. And maybe they're not at their best because you're not at your best. So if you got all this time with them in the pandemic to really see the beauty of them, like me just getting to be back here and because Kevin always woke up with them and he used to say, he's like, it's such a beautiful experience to wake up with them. And I used to be like, he's high. I don't want to get up. (laughs) You get up. Cool. I'm so glad you're loving it. But I see it now. Now that I'm doing it, I'm like, seeing her like stretch out her little legs and do her dog. What is it? Downward Downward dog. facing dog. And... And then her giggling with me because she wants to get up and eat and potty. And she's so happy. And I'm like, this is the most amazing. What a great way to prime for your day is by yep. pulling a little pause and telling her she's a little bitch. And I love her so much. And then Max jumps in. So <laughs> listen, we have a sliver of time. Figure out how you want to use it. But also we have a sliver of time and then they only are here for a sliver of oh, time. I know. That's the worst. And that's, I remember, you know, we grew up with dogs always. And my parents, especially, you know, my mom, so attached to them. And I remember when our last dog, Kevin, died, (laughs) I was like, mom, why aren't you getting another dog? And she was like, I can't, I can't handle that. I can't handle the heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad. I mean, it's the worst way to look at it, but it's like, we do only have them for, if we're lucky, 15 years, you've had yours for longer because you guys have done all the right things. But it's like, that would break my heart. I can't even, like, I can't even think about it. I know. That's why Kevin won't get bigger breeds because mm-hmm. they only live like eight to 10 years. Oh my gosh, yeah. And so Max, we didn't realize was going to be a bigger breed technically, but we are going to will him to, oh, yeah. I mean, he eats the best food. I mean, he's, he's, yeah, he's going to live to 15, 16 for sure. Anyhow, let's get into this. Rodney Habib is the founder of the world's largest pet health page on Facebook called Planet Paws. Dr. Karen Becker is a proactive and integrative wellness veterinarian, and both are best-selling authors. The two of them globetrotted pre-pandemic to research for their new book, The Forever Dog. They got their best wisdom from top geneticists, microbiologists, and longevity researchers, also interviewing people whose dogs have lived in their 20s and even 30s. I can't wait. The results they're going to share with us and uh, they're going to share all the results and they're surprising and their advice, of course, is invaluable and their inspiring stories about dogs and people who love them are going to strike a chord with any animal lover out there. So Heel Squad, let's give a warm welcome to Rodney and Karen. Hi, guys. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Of course, Winnie is here as my special contributor. She will be uh, interjecting questions via Bark. 
<laughs> She's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but congrats, first of all, on being a New York Times bestseller. I said, I don't know if any other dog books have been number one on the New York Times list, have they? That, Not about dog health. Yeah, I think this is the first. The, yeah. the publisher told us that there's never been a dog book like this, and there's never been a dog health book ever in the history that's ever made uh, the number one New York Times bestseller. And that that is just it. Just goes to show mm-hmm. how many pet parents there are out there that just want to do better. This yes. is, I, I mean, I tip my hat off to them. Absolutely. Well, I know um, I've had uh, I've had you guys here before. We've talked about diet and how important it is, and. Um, and you guys are just so knowledgeable on this, but you went even further and started traveling to, to talk to top researchers and stuff. So I definitely want to dive into your findings. Um, this is now like the new doggy Bible in the house. Um, (laughs) I just, uh, I just am so excited because we all want our, our, our babies to live forever, but also to have quality lives. And I think for us in our house, Kevin and I, have really worked hard to heal our pets of things that were unhealable. You know, I think I've told you guys my Bichon had pancreatitis and kidney failure. You can't fix one without ruining the other, but Kevin figured it out. And the dog vet, the vet was like, I've never seen this in my entire career. He's like, this is a miracle dog. And so whether it was bladder stones using Cranactin supplements or um, autoimmune diseases where we offset the prednisone so that she could have another nine years um, where the vet thought she was going to get six months. We've really worked hard on healing our pets with nutrition and supplements and a lot of love um, and just not quitting, right? But that's the same thing in the human world. You know, when my mom then got sick, I applied a lot of the same kind of ideas, Um to my mom and the same thing. I wasn't just going to listen to any doom and gloom. There's always a way if you want there to be. You're just going to have to put a lot more effort in. So when I was seeing how much diet is important, I'm like, well, isn't that the same for us? It's it's so true. And Maria, I think the, the most shocking part is when you think about veterinarians who are compassionate, kind, amazing people, but as a profession, we're still the only profession advocating for a lifetime of ultra-processed, highly refined food from birth to death. I mean, pediatricians say, mamas, feed your kids more fresh food. Nutritionists say, hey, let's decrease the amount of ultra-processed foods. Let's start getting uh, at least fresher foods in. You know, we, our food choices come from better knowledge. We can make smarter choices when we have more information. But because we are choosing for our pets, we better have enough knowledge to choose wisely. Yeah. You know, and I'll say this, Maria, when we, you know, when we were in your studio last time. And I got to sit down and talk to Kevin and yourself. You guys are cut from the same cloth that we are. The the pet parents that strive to want to do better, want to push more. I remember having the conversation with Kevin. He's like, listen, this is what we're doing. We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. I was, my jaw was on the ground, right? (laughs) Those are my people. And, you know, us, the mission from day one has always been to try to not just empower those, but there's nothing worse than being a pet parent and not knowing what to do. There's nothing worse. And you, you, I'm sure at some point you guys felt this when you walk into a clinic, you leave with a diagnosis, and you're like, what the, what the heck are we going to do right now? Mm-hmm. We have no idea what to do. But when you're empowered, when you know about the benefits of nutrition, especially when you've implemented it in your own diet or with a family member's diet and you've seen those improvements, there is nothing more empowering. Yeah, and also it's like, I know just my journey with my mom, there is like a gut instinct. There is like a a common sense to some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when we got the bladder stones diagnosis with baby 20 years ago, they're like, she's going to be prone to them now. And I said, so we're going to be here, what, on the regular having surgery? This makes no sense to me. And then Kevin in researching with his mom, she was like, yeah, you should try Cranactin. And so we're like, cranberry... That makes sense. Okay, it's good for like the urinary tract. All right, well, we put it the supplement in our food every morning and every night. I asked the vet, how much time do we have before she like dies? They said, you got a month. And over that month, all of them disappeared. Wow. So. And, and so people, is- you got to use your common sense too and your gut instinct a little in the safe measures. Like you have to have a safe zone. But I did the same thing with my mom and my mom got almost five years with something that takes people six to 12 months. 
Yeah. But you are spot on with the common sense aspect. In fact, when people say, hey, what kind of medicine do you do? I say I practice common sense medicine. Yeah. <laughs> which is, it, you just do what your grandma told you to do. Eat a variety of foods, get really good rest, you know, t- take care of your body. Just move. Make wise decisions. Right. Move every day. Sweat a little bit every day. Those recommendations They didn't have science back then to back it up, but they knew from generation to generation, it's generational wisdom that somehow didn't get translated necessarily into veterinary medicine. And part of that is because, of course, they're different species. So a lot of pet parents say, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I'm just going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. The downside about waiting, and this is why I wrote the book, was, you know, as a proactive wellness veterinarian, my goal is to intentionally partner with my clients to prevent degeneration from occurring. So I'm kind of helping them along. But if you don't have a proactive veterinarian that is intentionally advocating for your dog in terms of what we're going to do to not have breakdown, the body will break down. And then you're left being reactive, which is okay. Now we have a diagnosis. Now what? And then, then the gray zone comes in that Rodney was talking about where you're overwhelmed. You don't know what to do. There's nothing worse than confusion when you're in crisis. That is a terrible place to be. And knowledge and information is what brings you out of that discomfort. So really we wrote the book for everyone that doesn't have a proactive veterinarian (laughs) to be on their team. But it's also health traveling up the leash. I mean, that's kind of the most important part here. When we went and sat down with some of these longevity scientists, Nobel prize winning scientists, geneticists, they were like, Hey man, this information is translatable all across the board. As far as when it comes to like dogs and humans, the same concepts, it was the same feedback they were getting from people that read the book. Hey, eat less, eat fresher, move more, less stress. This isn't any type of rocket science by any means. But what's really cool about this, Maria, is watching the effect that it has on the pet parent. Like when we were, when we, when we sat with the scientists from Sweden and we were talking about stress within the household, lots of people are like, okay, I'm a super stressful person, but I'm going to, let's say, um, my dog is not so stressful. I have a golden retriever and he's always happy. So he's fine. I'm not. But those scientists were able to show that over long term, your dog will sync up with your stress levels. Like you may think that your dog is happy all the time, but if you are very stressed out, you're churning a lot of cortisol, your dog over time will sync up with your stress levels and that can shorten their lifespan. So if you want to see like a giant kick to the butt of, Hey, I got to kind of clean up my own act. That's the type of research that we brought out into the book that I, I believe that will maybe push people a little bit to, you know, start doing stuff for their own health as well. Yeah. So what did you guys learn or what do you suggest um, for, you know, because the other thing of this is, is veterinarians have only been around for how long? Well, there, I, Iowa State School of Veterinary Medicine, my college, is the first vet school in the world the oldest vet school. This is terrible. I don't know what year it started, but honestly, I think maybe late 1800s, right? Yeah. It's it's brand new. It is new. It's newer than medicine for us. Of course. Right? So, so I always think that vets are like so further behind. I mean, when I go in and they're giving us this food at the vet (laughs) and I'm like, this is not good. And it's so high in fat. I know this isn't good, but you know, obviously they're making some kind of money from it on the other side. And it's just, we're just always blown away. But, you know, there's preventative, right? There's the the preventative and then there's the um, longevity. So how do we kind of tackle those two things the best? Well, prevention, of course, comes down to identifying the lifestyle variables that that are roadblocks for wellness, vitality, longevity to occur. And the Broad Institute has identified several, of course, genetics. You can't change your DNA. But Maria, one of the things that was really empowering for us is the number of researchers now looking at epigenetic factors, which are in our control. So, you know, our environment speaks to our DNA and speaks to our dog's DNA. And we are in control of that. So things like polyphenols, Polyphenol levels matter. Unfortunately, polyphenols are sensitive to heat. What so are polyphenols? Cook, po- polyphenols are bioactive molecules in fresh foods that have beneficial effects on the body. They help the body 
um, maintain health and also help with cellular health. So polyphenols, antioxidants, you know, scavenging free radicals in the body, there are substances found only in fresh foods. So when foods are heated three, four times, which is what happens with highly processed foods, those beneficial biomolecules that aren't really talked about are gone. Enzymes are gone. Polyphenols are gone. We know when you heat your food really, really to high temperatures, we know, of course, nutrients degrade. Vi the vitamin content is less. We know those common sense things. But what we're not talking about in veterinary medicine is what happens when the food is heated repeatedly. Yes, there's, of course, a nutritional impact, a negative nutritional impact. But in addition to that, there are unwanted byproducts of the high heat process in and of itself called advanced glycation end products. That's part of the reason that human doctors are recognizing that fast food is bad for you. The question is, why is fast food bad? Like, what is it? Because sure, it's not it's real food. Calories. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's food like particles all mashed together. And at one time it was real food, but through all of the refinement that it's not. The downside is, is that these unwanted byproducts of high heat temperatures accumulate in the body and they literally age your body. So yes, we have a nutritional deficiency issue with ultra processed food. Yes, we have, like you said, high fat, hydrogenated fats, rendered fats, oxidized fats, bad things. But we also have other unwanted byproducts of eating, of feeding our pets ultra processed foods every single day. And that's just one variable, Maria. Nutrition is just one part of the equation. So that's the lifestyle piece that we tend to focus on, but lest us not forget all of the other environmental impacts that can and do affect longevity. So one of the things that's really critical about, as you had mentioned earlier, being uh, you know the difference between a proactive, let's say, pet parent and a reactive pet parent, you don't want to wait till something's broken. And that's what a lot of people do. There was a study that came out of the United Kingdom that showed that when a pet parent takes their let's say their dog for the first time to a clinic, usually that dog is suffering from two or more problems. Mm. You think you're going in for one, you have a whole bunch coming down the road, right? Being a proactive pet parent is so important today. It's like a car, running a car, let's say without engine oil and not putting engine oil in it, and driving and driving and driving till the car eventually breaks down. And then you go to the mechanic and you're like, hey, why don't I put some engine oil in this now? Well, you've already done some damage, right? And it's really important that we want to, you know, in this journey and all the research that we were bringing to the forefront was like, listen, it's what you do, especially as a human, it's what you do in your 30s and your 40s and mm -hmm. let's say your 50s that helps you live well into your 70s, 80s, 90s and above. And the same holds true for a dog, right? Don't wait till your dog is eight, nine or 10 limping around the house, all suffering from arthritis, inflammation and so on and so forth. And then being like, hmm should I have brought some glucosamine or some omega-3 in his life? Because that's typically the thing that happens with a lot of pet parents. They just don't know. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to highlight those things, start these things early to help protect your pet in the future, be proactive. There's this difference between biologic aging and chronologic aging, right? The number, like your dog being, let's say, eight, eight years is the number of birthdays we celebrated with our pooch. But our dog's internal cellular aging biologic aging, your dog is aging between two and three years of age. And that really blew us away. When we talked to Dr. David Sinclair, one of the most cited scientists in the entire world, he said between two and three years of age, there's visible signs of significant aging happening in the vast majority of dogs. Ooh. But your dog's still hyperactive, bouncing around, looks amazing. What are you doing for the biologic aging? And we aren't as a profession and we aren't as pet parents. And so recognizing that there's a lot that can be done preemptively to prevent degeneration from occurring is a big piece of being proactive. Um, and then the longevity piece of it comes around from obviously genetics play into that. Epigenetic factors actually weigh heavily, more heavily than genetics. But Rodney's obsession with these ancient, old, thriving dogs in the world, it was pretty profound when we talked to their owners because many of these owners we're practicing exactly what you just said, common sense. They, they knew that their dogs needed to get out every day. They knew that their dogs needed to have social interactions with other dogs and roll in the dirt and be in sunshine and move their bodies every day. That was just natural for those owners. And it's so wonderful because out of their common sense came these amazing representations of what we can all strive for to achieve as dog owners, these extra long-lived dogs. So how long, I mean, you guys said these dogs are living into their 20s and 30s. I know. Isn't it romantic? And what did they so like, eat? 
Like that's the, the first I mean, thing I want to know is yes, what did they eat? Yes, right. Absolutely. The number one question I had, especially when like Maggie, the 30 year old Kelpie from Australia started surfacing all over the internet. What's a Kelpie? All major, so it's, it, a it's, it's, it's a breed Australian from breed. Australia, right? Are so they it's, big? it's around like a around 60 pounds, I think Maggie was, 60, 65 pounds, according to Brian McLaren, her owner, the farmer. Okay. Um, so it is a big dog. I mean, you know, it's a it's a nice mid-sized dog. Um, so it's not by tiny by any means, but when when it when major media started to pick up, hey man, there's a 30 year old dog in Australia. I I lost my mind first of all, and of course the number one question any pet parent would be asking is like, can you tell me right now what that dog was eating? Yeah. You tell me right now what that dog yeah, was eating. It's like when you and see J Lo, what are you doing? I, right? <laughs> how do you not look 50? Yes. We need to know. It's the same thing with the dog. You're 30. How the frig does that happen? We need to exactly know. Right. What are you eating? And don't tell me I blueberries, can't. JLo. What? I'm kidding. <laughs> it's true. Anyway. So that, I can't tell you how hard it was. To, first of all, to get that information, it was so hard. He was a dairy farmer in Perth in Australia. We wanted to know so badly because no, no one in the media asked the question. I had to, I put out a, a, like a nationwide search in Australia to like our incredible Australian followers. I was like, I will give you one of my kidneys if somebody can track this man down. Our incredible followers like got in their cars, no way. drove down to his yeah, farm, got it. his telephone number because he wasn't even on email at that point. He had to go to his neighbor's house to do a Skype interview with me to sit down. And like, Sounds I started like the to grill life him, like, I want. You tell me right now, <laughs> Maria, this dog's regime was unbelievable. Now I will say this before getting into Maggie. We found a lot of dogs. We know that there was a uh, Bushki where the Hungarian scientists were working on this dog. He was on a farm, was 27 years old. Again, another mid-sized 60, around maybe 50 or 60 pound dog. Uh, yes. There was dogs all over America in their twenties, mid twenties. So when we sat down with these people, there was one common through line between all of these dogs. They were all eating some form of fresh food, whether some had entirely fresh food diets or some where the owners were heads up. Like for instance, Augie from the United States, 20 year old golden retriever, maybe the oldest golden retriever that we know of. Her owner, they said they had a garden and they would go out fresh in the garden. They pull out like snap peas and a whole bunch of vegetables and they would incorporate in the diet. These dogs were eating just like right immediately from the, the garden. And what benefit is that Exist. to the gut? So the Purdue study, uh, demonstrated that adding fresh, colorful vegetables to to ultra processed food to kibble three times a week can reduce the incidence of bladder cancer by seventy percent. Just adding a handful of colorful veggies three times a week. So when you think about Maggie or any of these dogs, all of these dogs did have access to minimally processed foods or fresh foods. So that certainly was a key, but there were other variables. They all move their bodies and yeah. a lot. They all literally spent their lives walking around. And when you think about well-loved dogs in the U.S., we take them around the block and we're like, there you go for the yeah. day. <laughs> that was your walk, right? Or maybe if you're lucky twice a day, you get a 10 minute walk twice a day. Mm -hmm. We forget that dogs are wired as athletes and they need to sprint and move mm. their bodies and build their muscle mass, not just for cardiovascular fitness, but for hormonal balance and for stress release and cortisol, minimizing cortisol and of course, blood glucose. So let, let, let me say this about Maggie though, cause I know you're, I know you love exercise and it's so Maggie got ridiculous exercise, by the way, according to Brian McLaren, 20 kilometers of exercise, Maria, a day walking a day. around the farm. Like who does that? Yeah, right? we all, it it's was, not even possible for all of us, right? Like right? I struggle to get out into the tennis court at night with the dog and have him run because I know he needs that sprinting. So I'll play ball with him in the tennis court. And, but I also have a tennis court who has a tennis court. Like some people will take their dog to the dog park on weekends, but that's the most they can do outside of the walk around the neighborhood. Right, yeah. right. You, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Of course, when Brian McLaren told me 20 kilometers, first of all, I was like, what do you mean 20 kilometers? What are you talking about? <laughs> but he's like, well, one end of my dairy farm from one end to the other is five kilometers and I'm on my tractor and I go once and then back in the morning and then once and then back in the evening and my dog is behind me walking. So that is 20 kilometers. I was like, are you doing that like a couple times a week? He's like, no, I do that seven days a week, my friend, I'm a farmer. And I was like, holy moly. Yeah. But to touch on when you were like, well, what were these dogs eating? When we sat down with microbiologists, for instance, Dr. Tim Spector uh, from the United Kingdom in the King's College, I know Reuters Magazine say he's like 1% of the most scient cited scientists in the world. All microbiologists know Tim Spector. He said to us, Maria, he was like, we know now in, with enough research that the more diverse your gut biome is, you know, all the different types of vegetables that Maria's putting in her body and Max's body and Winnie's body, like all of her dogs' bodies, 
that bacteria, the more diverse your gut biome is, the longer that you're going to live and or the better health span mm -hmm. you will have. You're going to have some form of effect with a diverse belly. Look at Maggie. Her owner was sharing. Now, we're not recommending these things, but her owner was sharing. Brian McLaren was sharing raw milk straight out of the cow with his dog. Imagine the gut bacteria. The dog was eating the food from like farm rich soil. Imagine the bacteria. And we asked, what's Maggie's favorite food? <laughs> he said, well, do you really want to know? And we said, yeah. Dirt. He said, placenta. <laughs> placenta, because he's a dairy farmer. And so he's like, as the cows would give birth, she would be there to Shut eat up. the afterbirth. I know. And we were, I mean, so we, there again. I mean, who has access to placenta? No one. And who would eat it otherwise? But no imagine the nutrition in placenta. Like if, if the scientists analyze that, I'm sure it's full of a lot of nutrients. But oh, just yeah. just think about her microbiome. Well, women I mean, eat their just... placentas now so they can get all of those nutrients. So that's right. Okay. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Guys. So here's the thing. I'll say my shepherd and my standard poodle um, live to, I think 16, but like, again, they're rescues. So they're all approximates, right? We know when we rescued Apollo, he was about a year, ba he was still a baby, but he was about a year and Athena was six from what they said. So, you know, we have to do our approximates and we didn't do vigorous workouts. We did walk in the um, neighborhood and up these hills that were pretty excruciating. My neighbors all hate me when I take them on their walks. Um, I was like, come on guys, let's go for a walk. They're like, this is like a killer. But we, we did do more walking with them and the little ones and the little ones lived to 18 and, uh, the big ones lived to almost 16. Right. So I don't know. I think to me, it's the nutrition. That's the biggest part. I think if you can get them the most exercise, it's a goal. I know that we're all really busy and we have like limited slivers of time, um, but that's where having a, a, a buddy come over and run with them, like a, another dog friend helps. If you've got a little bit of a yard, they can run around like crazy, but it is the nutrition that's so important. And the same thing goes for us. And when you talk about variety, when I was feeling my best, it was when I was realizing I had been a creature of habit, eating the same things every day. And when I started adding in random things, like, all right, I'm going to eat some kiwi this week. I'm going to throw some pineapple, like different things. I started getting more energy and I started feeling better. Mm -hmm. And so imagine eating a scientifically formulated food. I didn't know this. Dr. Marion Nessel, one of the like most hailed nutritionists in all of the U S she said that there is a product for humans that are super busy. It's called Soylent. And it literally, it's like insured liquid beverage that has all the vitamins and minerals that humans need. So of course, when you're hospitalized, you drink insure, which is like an all in one shake that has every vitamin, mineral, amino acid, fatty acid in it. Great. But you wouldn't live on insure or soylent yeah. at, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Those are for critical times. Do. It is critical times. And just like, you know, babies get infant formula. If you're not nursing, you're giving infant formula, but then your kid goes on to real food and hopefully a diversified diet. What if you just had baby formula your whole life? You would have a very monotonous gut. Mm. You would not have diversity. You would actually end up with a very, a very sensitive stomach, which most dogs have yeah. because of their lack of diversity, right? The number one thing that dogs have are GI issues. <gasps> Those GI issues, of course, I estimate 95% of dogs in the U.S. have dysbiosis or an abnormal ratio of gut flora that then in turn affects their gut, uh, their gut immune system, GALT, which then in turn affects their, their in turn affects their systemic immune system. So there's this hierarchy, there's this cascading effect of one diet creating a an very unhealthy gut that then creates systemic inflammation that then leads to a cascade of different issues in the body, depending on your dog's breed, their age, and their environment. But it does start with the gut. And because we're not focused on intentionally creating a resilient, strong gut, we're left with all of the downstream effects of a dysbiosis, microbiome issues, and then in turn, the cascade of leaky gut. Of course, it could just be gastritis, colitis, enteritis, IBS, IBD, all those things come from food but then it keeps going. Then you have itchy dogs and allergic dogs, and then you have autoimmune disease, which is one step past. When your immune system reacts to things in the environment, you have an allergic dog. When your immune system attacks itself, that's the ultimate immune confusion. And it's all- And then they get cancer. It's just like us. 
it's like you don't hear the first alarm, then it goes to the next alarm, then it goes yes. to the next alarm. Now you got cancer. That's really kind of the trajectory that I see. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a common sense person. But I think you're ringing the alarm for me with my babies because I do think about sometimes, oh my God, they eat the same thing every day, twice a day, same fucking thing. Like that's that can't be good. With Max, we are putting like fresh stuff in there that we cook. But when you talk about how when you heat things up, you lose the nutrients. How do we give them a good diet? Because the other thing that I struggle with is, I mean, Max has, um, has, uh, we have to give him pain, uh, panic care because he can't digest his own food. Um, yeah. what's e- the condition? EPI. EPI. Exocrine pancreatic in- insufficiency. Yeah. EPI, yeah. which is a genetically predisposed condition for the pancreas to not secrete amylase, lipase, and protease to digest fats, carbs, and proteins. And that's a, that's a genetic thing. But isn't it awesome that by you basically giving him digestive enzymes, because his pancreas isn't making it, you're basically feeding him what his pancreas isn't making to help keep his system in homeostatic balance with a dog with EPI or any diagnosed inflammatory condition of the gut. You, your dog would need slow diversification, an improvement in rebuilding the gut resiliency and health. You wouldn't switch up. You wouldn't feed something different for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to that dog because he'll have explosive diarrhea and you'll be hospitalized. Like that is not the goal, right? Yes. Not the goal. Yeah. But don't think for a minute that just because your dog has any diagnosis, EPI or choose it, fill in the blank. It doesn't mean that you can't slowly and consistently work on building gut health, but also diversification of diet. It's a slow, consistent thing that you would do instead of a fast, sudden change. Is there like a probiotic we can throw in there for them? So what what what, what an awesome question. As I was just about to jump into that one. (laughs) Maria, one of the things that we highlight in the book is the importance of the gut bacteria and bacteria in the gut, as you were alluding to, let's say probiotic. One of the, some of the challenges for pet parents are, uh, you know, when you have a dog that's been on multiple rounds of antibiotics, like a human, right? Antibiotic, the Latin term against life, meaning we're going to wipe out everything, good and bad. And yes, you need antibiotics when you're in an emergency situation, but you got to have a rebuild plan, right? Just like a human, typically most humans know if they're doing multiple rounds of antibiotics or whatever the case may be, they're usually running out to get a, some sort of probiotic. Or most people do don't know something. that, Rodney. Well, I barely well, know that. I barely remember that. Luckily, I'm not on antibiotics really often, but it's a great reminder for us too. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you may, and, and you're probably spot on with that. I, my hope was that enough people realize that if you're going to damage your gut biome, you should do something about it. One of the key things that we wanted to highlight in this book is your original question, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I hope this was where the question was going, was, you know, what is the best diet or how do you sort of transition into these diets? And how do you, you give you them a, variety without hurting their stomachs? Exactly. Because all well we said. hear is if you change their diet too abruptly, which I've watched, we changed hers and it was like diarrhea and vomit and all of the stuff. Yeah. I was like, the poor thing. Um, and that was an accident that happened, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter, but it does, it does affect them. So how do you give them variety without hurting them? And then what so is I'll the let, best diet? <laughs> yes. And I'll, I'll let you jump in on, on, cause I know where you're going to go with this one. But one of the things that's important that a lot of people haven't thought about, and we've talked about this multiple times is having your veterinarian send a, send off a gut analysis on your dog's gut. What's going on in the gut? You have a whole subset of bacteria that are responsible for different things. As an example, there's a subset of bacteria called fusobacteria. That's responsible for the breakdown of protein. You have a bacteria like Provotella. That's responsible for the breakdown of carbohydrates. You have bacteroides, which are responsible for preventing harmful bacteria from colonizing in the gut. Maria, if you're missing, if your dog is missing these subset of bacteria, you hear this podcast, you're like, I'm going to go running to the fridge and I'm going to start jumping in here and I'm going to start mixing in all these foods. And you have a dog missing the subset of, let's say, bacteria to break down protein. You are going to struggle as a pet parent and your dog is going to struggle to help put this together. So as you're going to jump into the foods, I did want to highlight that this is something that not a lot of people know about. But more and more veterinarians today are sending off like to labs um, and these labs will, you know, these microbiologists, these uh, microbial ecologists, they call themselves, will actually look under the hood of your dog and say, hey, here's what's missing. Here's what we can put back, which is called an FMT, a fecal microbiome transplant, which is a subset of probiotics that you were talking about. But they do that for people. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And you can, your dog will 180. If you've got a dog with allergies, IBD, what uh, any type of inflammatory response, chronic disease, looking up an FMT is maybe one of the most beneficial starting points that you could do for your dog. So it's but called an FMT diet. test. Well, it's, no, I was just going to say, actually, Maria, you, you can do it through your veterinarian, but there's a company called Animal Biome in Cali that you can submit it yourself. You just submit a little of your dog's poop and they'll mm -hmm. tell you how balanced or unbalanced your dog's gut is. And then they'll help you rebalance your dog's gut. That's a fantastic starting point. Okay. So if you have a sensitive tummy dog, start there because your sensitive dog, you have to remember dogs as a species are resilient and strong and highly successful. They've been around thousands of years and so they've been co-evolving with humans eating our trash. Yeah. If you think about the first bag of dog food came about like 120 years ago. It's not like dogs have not been eating kibble thousands of years ago. They were eating whatever, literally whatever they found. In addition to dirt and poop and carrion, that's dead animals, they'll catch and kill bunnies. They'll eat whatever they can find. Dogs have to have a gut of steel to sustain that type of environment. The amount of bacteria and the amount of diversification that they were eating up until a hundred years ago would be really impressive. If we could go back and analyze old, you know, dogs from 1800, analyze their gut, it would be shockingly diverse because they, they literally ate everything. When we decided that an ultra processed, highly refined diet was the best thing <laughs> we could do. And then we gave the very poor advice to never switch your dog's food. We end up with butterfly stomachs and a whole host of GI issues as the beginning of the iceberg of a whole host of systemic inflammatory lifestyle related diseases. I like that she's going to, she's like, you know, I'm not sure about this part. When he's like, like I'm standing going. for this one. She's exactly. like, I like where this is going. <laughs> I'm bored of the same food, so, mom. So ideally, Maria, when you get a puppy, just like with your kids, you don't just feed your kids Fruit Loops because they end up not wanting to ever eat healthy food. I, when I see puppies, I'm like, listen, do you want to create a gut of steel? My clients say, yes, of course. And we intentionally work on rotating through you know, beef, chicken, turkey, venison, bison, quail, goat, rabbit. We'll just rotate through all those different proteins. There's no way you could do that with your babes right now because your babes would be hospitalized right, mm. from explosive diarrhea. They, they have not had that foundation of a strong, resilient gut building experience. But that doesn't mean you can't do it now. But tiny micro steps. In your situation, yes, you. I think starting out with a uh, with a gut analysis to determine what your dog's microbiome is is a really wise idea. But then you think about what foods can and can't my dog eat. You let's say that you know that zucchini is a solid choice that you can give a sliver of zucchini, and you've not had any issues. You might be able to try zucchini and squash, and and you're giving the size of a pea, like you're giving this much, and that's it for the day. The watch is poop. Because if he handles this much of a zucchini and you did not have even mucus, you didn't have loose stool, that's awesome. Try this much of a zucchini twice a day and then try a little bit more. And as you work through, you open up your fridge and say, you know what? I've got a blueberry. It's a little mushy. I don't want to eat this one. I'm going to feed it to my dog. One blueberry, not 50. Okay. One. I get mushy blueberries all the time. Exactly. And you know, it was Dr. David Sinclair that said, listen, all the dented apple pieces, all the mushy blueberries, all, everything that you don't really want to eat. You have to remember that every single time fruit or vegetables get a scar or a damage or a dent, all of the polyphenols yeah. rush to that area to try and stabilize and fix, yeah. the, fix the fruit or veggie. So actually the dented and dinked fruit the mushier the veg is the fruit. actually So then we should be now, eating it too. I one know, for you, gross. one for me. It's true. Yeah, I just yeah, don't Yeah, the like scientists, it. like just, uh, <laughs> it's the, true. not to cut you off, the scientists will tell you, yeah, when you start, you don't want anything that doesn't look stressed when it comes to a vegetable as a human to eat, right? Like when you go in and you buy usually the perfect carrot, it's it's not experienced any stress, therefore the polyphenols are typically lower. It's yeah. those ones that had to go, that were defenseless, that had to you know, fight in the environment that are usually the healthiest. Yeah. Sorry. And, but I, I did find that amazing that the, several of our scientists said, when you used to go to the grocery store and you pick out the most perfect veggie, they said, you know, we now recognize that we kind of want the ones that look like they went through war because they're actually more nutritious. Yeah. Who would have known? <laughs> Who would have known? All the, and all the pieces and parts, for instance, if, you're a, if you peel your carrots, I don't. But if you're a carrot, if you peel it, feed the carrot peels to your dogs. They don't care. When you chop off the top and bottom of celery, if you, most dogs won't eat celery, it just 
doesn't taste amazing for most mammals. But if your dog will eat it, like if you have a Labrador that eats anything, when you're the fluffy part of the celery that really no one eats, feed it to your dog. Like don't throw things out, chop them up, mat them to your dog's bowl. But Slow, Maria, yeah. based on your dog's poo. So how fast do you switch foods? It's all about your dog's body. And how does your dog body talk to you? You check the poo every single day. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are going at a pace that doesn't push your dog's GI tract into overdrive or be too much, slow and steady rinse the race. You got to feed your dog every day anyway. Why not begin feeding a literally 0.05% of something new to introduce that new food into your dog's body at such a slow, subtle pace that nothing happens other than profound gut diversification. So balance is critical, of course, and time is of the essence, of course, and people are busy today, of mm -hmm. course. Nobody has time to go to the refrigerator sometimes, pull out all these incredible like organic meats or vegetables or whatever it is you're eating today and hand make a meal every single day. We all have busy lives. So one of the big questions is, and one of the ones that we wanted to address in the book, of course, is, all right, I just went into my pet specialty retailer what on earth am I taking? The shelves are just mm -hmm. loaded with different colored bags, different processing techniques. Where, what is the best diet that I'm going to be picking here? And this is where Dr. Becker like really broke it down into this chart where you alluded to it earlier, Maria, the more heat that you apply to food, logically, the more damage that's done to that food. So when selecting a food, rather than talking about like the best brands, we wanted to talk about the best processing techniques. Meaning if I go in, and I buy, let's say, a bag of dried pellets. Let's say I'm buying kibble. Okay, I'm starting here. But maybe I want a little bit more moisture. So if I look over in the can section, less heat is applied. Oh, maybe cans a little bit better. Oh, look, there's another uh, dehydrated product. There's a freeze-dried product. There's a frozen product in the refrigerator. We've got a scale, of course, and, and it's, a, it's not a hard scale by any means. It's just less heat, the better your pet is off the more diverse their gut biome will be. Yeah. So and is raw food the best? Raw food contains the most bioavailable nutrients that can be passed up the food chain. So just raw foods being the best, just like for our bodies, raw foods are incredibly healthy. And in my opinion, are the best in terms of nutrition. The problem with raw diets are threefold. Number one, you can't, if you decide to do it homemade, you can't guess at a recipe. You have to follow, even it, not just raw, raw cooked anything. If you're going to DIY pet food, you have to follow a recipe because the vast majority of people guess wrong. And of course that can result in nutritional deficiencies, not the goal. The second issue with raw food is a lot of people live with immunosuppressed humans. Now, yes, dogs eat crap and lick their butts. Humans don't do that because we would be sick. Dogs do stuff like that that could make humans very sick. So if you live with an immunocompromised person and there's raw meat around, it's the same risk. You know, mm. if you're t the raw meat on your kitchen counter, if you're going to grill burgers and feed it to your two-legged kids, it's the exact same meat that you would feed to your dog. But it still is a bacterial risk. So here's the good news. Commercially available raw food diets in the U.S., about half of them have been pasteurized, which means they have gone through high pressure pasteurization, which removes all the bacteria so that the raw meat actually becomes sterile. So if you're freaked out about bacteria, just buy sterile raw foods. So homemade diets have nutritional issues because of people not following recipes. We can eliminate that issue by following a recipe. If you're nervous about bacteria, you can buy sterile raw food. So raw food is a fantastic option. The third big hurdle, Maria, though, is cost. It's incredibly, just like feeding your kids organic food mm -hmm. from Whole Foods raw is like three is times the cost of, of, of the dollar menu. Like you can yeah. go through McDonald's and feed your kids for half the price of cooking organic food. It's sad, but true. And same is true with healthy foods for your dogs, incredibly expensive. So but that's why, he, that's why starting in teaspoon, sorry, Maria, is the most important thing. Like the average, a new statistic came out that said the average American citizen on their pet is spending $23 a month. That's not a lot of wow. money. So when we went to the scientists and we said to the scientists, okay, in your opinion, what is the best type of food? A lot of the microbiologists, Maria, are feeding raw whole live foods. The microbiologists themselves are feeding it because of course they can look under the hood under the in, in a microscope and see the diversity of bacteria in their dogs. So what we did was we flew to Finland and we sat down with the veterinary scientists who were doing a lot of research on adding fresh live foods into a bowl of ultra processed food. Like how much would you need if you're on a budget? Just starting, Maria, with... 20%, 20% 20 
was enough to lower disease markers, homocysteine and methionine, that the researchers were measuring. Just adding 20% was enough to drop those disease markers. So you don't really have to, you you don't have to go like full blown into it. Is that like just just chopping up some kale and mixing it in there? Yeah. Okay. So question, raw food is usually like, it's usually just raw meat. That can't be enough for an animal. Like we do, like we get the patties from Max, but then we add carrots and peas and kale and quinoa in there. And so you're, you're and we're not following a recipe. So now I'm going to go look into a recipe. (laughs) So what, what's most important, Maria, is that the patties that you're getting, if you're buying commercially available raw food, it will say on the front of it, this food is nutritionally complete, or it will say this is for supplemental feeding. If the patties you have say supplemental feeding, it is not nutritionally complete. And then it's really imperative that you balance the diet. If your patties say, this is a nutritionally complete food for all life stages, then that base diet actually is, it has either been fortified with vitamins and minerals, or they've had other ingredients added to make the recipe meet minimum nutritional requirements for dogs. So your job is to look at that, look at your package and see if it's complete or missing nutrients. But so the fact that you're feeding patties, raw patties is fan. It's raw. I'm assuming. Is that right? Yeah. Or fro- is it frozen? So that's beautiful. They're frozen. We defrost them. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And then, so you're doing a fantastic job of already giving minimally processed raw diet. And then at the time of feeding, you're adding in extra goodies that contain fiber, polyphenols, phytonutrients, all enzymes, right? All those goodies at the time yeah. of feeding, which is a really big blessing for your dog's GI tract. Well, we need Max to live a long time and he's, he's got the healthiest, most beautiful coat guys. He's stunning. Uh, He's my everything. Do you know, um, I think we were, when I think you had just gotten him when we were there last, I think you had just adopted him. Yeah. He was so skinny. He was all bones. Now he's, he's almost 130 pounds. He's a beast. Now I'll say this. So now I want to ask you guys about, you know, you guys are the ones I think that taught us and we put you guys on the gas pumps with the tip of the day, but um, that if your dog is pooping more than twice a day or once a day, they're eating too much. Max poops like four times a day, guys. That dog poops and poops and poops. I'll pick it up and he poops again. I'll pick it up and then he poops a third time. I know he's overeating, but he's hungry. But your dog also has EPI. So your dog has a medical diagnosis that has resulted in him not being able to extract all of the nutrients from his food because his mm-hmm. pancreas is not secreting enough enzymes. So you're off the hook. Okay, You're cool. off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look at him, I'm like, he's healthy. He doesn't look fat. His coat is shiny and good. Yeah. So I'm like, I think he's fine. But I definitely always keep remembering that in the back of my head. Now, Winnie, she poops like once a day, maybe twice. She gets her little nugget out, but... You know, she eats her her canned um, food. She does Waruva. There's some incredible companies now, too, that are doing home delivery in America. I wish we had more companies here in Canada that are doing that. There's some great companies that are doing, like, the lightly cooked process, Maria, where it's not mm-hmm. it, it's not raw, but it's also hasn't been rendered and heated four times. Mm. Some incredible manufacturers that will actually chop up, like, the, the kale and the broccoli and some of these organic and, ingredients. And all human grade. All human grade. They package Amazing. it for you. They freeze it. They mail it to your door. They even show you making it. There is some incredible options right now in the world. It's unbelievable watching pet parents who are inspired and then saying, you know what? I want to make a difference in the world and starting these startup companies. But the coolest thing about all these brand new startup, human grade, really passionate pet food companies is it's the demand from guardians pushing the industry. It's not the top five monopoly. You know, it's not Mars and Purina. Yeah. Saying, hey, you know what? We're going to produce a nutritionally complete, species appropriate, fresh food diet. None of them have done that. It's owners saying, I'm not going to feed this anymore to my dog. And it's those companies realizing that someone has to produce food to fill this budding, growing number of really well-informed, educated pet parents that recognize they they want to feed different food because they want a different outcome than their last yeah. dog. And that's driving the industry, which is super exciting for us to see. I have a couple last questions. Um, one, I'm trying to help a friend's dog. Um, it's like a, a mini Australian cattle dog who lost his hair. 
He's got all these patches of just no hair. And he was a full, healthy, happy, you know, furry dog. And then at some point it came back. And I know it was tied to some stressful stuff with the parents. But um, but I said, like, let's start visualizing the pores opening and hair coming out of the follicles. So we're doing like some healing stuff. But is there something I changed the diet? I got rid of the kibble um, as the fake vet that I am. I got rid of the kibble. I added some um, omega threes and salmon oil right. and that to the to the diet because I do think supplementation is so important. And you mentioned glucosamine, my German shepherd before Max never had one hip problem. He oh, died awesome. with full healthy hips because he was on glucosamine his whole life. And so um, I wonder if you guys have any tricks for hair growth. Well, it depends on Maria why the hair is missing. So here's where my brain goes to. Number one, as l I'm sure that this has been covered, but I just have to say it. You're going to go to the vet. They're going to do a skin scraping. Make sure that there's not any external like demodectic mange, a non-contagious form of mange. First thing we think about is why does the hair fall out? It could be infectious, meaning demodex. It can be hormonal, meaning hypothyroidism mm -hmm. or endocrine imbalance. So adrenal dysfunction, thyroid dysfunction, but also sex hormones. So if this, I don't know if this dog was spayed or neutered at a young age, but desexing dogs, just like when we go through menopause, I watched him hormones, full on hump have sex with a stuffed animal. On the couch. But ju just because he's <laughs> humping doesn't mean that, okay. I yeah. mean, do but dogs that are neutered will still hump. It was yes. very aggressive, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it happens. Okay. You know, um, we just, I just recommend that you just have that stuffed animal and you just kind of keep it in a closet and just, you know, pull it out when the neighbor, when, they, when you don't have guests and Dying. just, you know, yes. So, but sex hormones play into hair. And so... If your friend has not checked thyroid, adrenal, or sex hormones, that is a big reason, a, a, including cortisol, right? Cortisol, stress hormones, thyroid, and, and estrogen, progesterone, testosterone all facilitate normal, happy, healthy hair, hair growth. And if that isn't occurring, if you have an endocrine disorder, no amount of dietary tweaking is going to fix an endocrine disorder, meaning mm -hmm. thyroid, adrenal, or sex hormones. So if you've ruled those things out... Then I would say, okay, let's look at nutrition. And you were super smart to get the dog off of highly processed food because those omega-3s are gone. The omega-3s that were once in there is fine, but you know, being processed at 400 degrees multiple times, omega-3 is gone. So adding that back in is really an important thing. But then you need to think about other things like, is the dog having a reaction or an allergic response to a component in the diet? And so I would want to walk down the path of, are there any other symptoms? Do you have any other behavior issues? What else is going on in that dog's environment? The last dog that my client that had this exact same situation, I did the endocrine testing, solid. We switched the diet, solid. I said to the owner, where does your dog spend time? And what this dog's situation ended up being was contact dermatitis. The dog was, uh, the owner was obsessive about cleaning during COVID and cleaning with pretty toxic household products. And people forget that dogs are naked and they're not showering all the time. And whatever you clean your house with is going to be end up not just on your dog, but in your dog. And their faces and are on the floor. So anything you're, if you're cleaning with pine salt, that's up their noses. That's, that's correct. Scented candles, VOCs, volatile organic compounds that come from scented candles, air fresheners, because what goes up so you can smell it, must come down. And your dog's laying. And now it's on their paws laying. and they're licking their paws. Absolutely. And we had That's this right. conversation, wow. if you remember, when, when the last time we were on your podcast, we were talking about lawns, mm -hmm. right? Lawn chemicals. What happens when dogs go outside and they lay in these chemicals? The dry times, according to researchers, are, you know, people will treat their lawns and, you know, this can spike so many different types of cancers, but there's a lot of research showing that professionally treated lawns, you've got a 70% uptick in the chances of your dog developing lymphoma cancer, right? With professionally treated lawns. And of course, people are treating their own lawns that doesn't make it any better. And the problem is, is the dry times. Researchers are finding three days isn't enough, eight days isn't enough, 12 days that sometimes these chemicals are still there. So those are a huge key factor. I think nutrition though, which you had mentioned, when we sat with Dr. Anna Helm-Bjorgman, the Finnish scientist, they did a study to show uh, what would 
diet change due to the skin, the skin gene expression. So it's it's awesome that you started mm -hmm. with nutrition because those scientists, if you go into Science Daily or you go to PubMed and you just type in dry food versus raw food and skin, it's going to pop up that study. That study made its way all around the internet. Scientists will show that just by switching from an ultra processed food to a fresher food, it activates the skin's the skin gene expression. Now the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory pathways, all of a sudden the skin starts to reverse and starts to heal, right? But again, this would kind of go back to that if I didn't do a gut biome check on my dog and my dog is missing a subset of bacteria, let's say fusobacteria to break down protein, and then I jumped into a fresher food diet, I may not be seeing the results I want to see because the gut too is also off. So it's very multifactorial. It is. And yeah. then there's also actually genetics. Just like, you know, males have male pattern bald baldness. There are some breeds that actually have genetic related, what we call alopecia hair loss. Mm -hmm. And then there's also topical contact dermatitis from chemicals like flea and tick, uh, the, the pesticides that we intentionally put on animals for flea and tick, that can cause patchy hair loss as well. So you have a long list of things that you can work through to yep. try and help your friend, which is awesome. I'm, but I'm working it's fantastic on it. that you started with a diet because Maria diet, even if diet doesn't fix the hair loss, you still radically improve that dog's life yeah. by improving the food. So awesome choice anyway, anyway, for improving the food. Absolutely. Well, we've covered a lot of different ailments in other episodes. So we'll link to that other episode with, um, you guys in the summary of this. In the meantime, I mean, I could talk to you guys for hours um, about all of this, but I'm so, so happy for you guys. Again, the book is called The Forever Dog. It is your new doggy Bible. It's a must. And you can um, find them on Instagram at Forever Dog Book or Rodney's website is rodneyhabib.com. Karen's is drkarenbecker.com backslash DVM backslash. We'll put links to all of this in the summary of this show. Um, always a pleasure, you guys. Thank you so much for all your hard work helping us help our babies. Mm. All right, guys, that was a lot from Dr. Karen and Rodney. Um, I think I know what I got to do. I got to start taking my dead blueberries and dead fruit mm. and dead vegetables and feeding them to the ducks. Just no in kidding. little increments. In little <laughs> increments. It's just nuts to me how, like, dogs are humans. Everything they're saying, I mean, I've been told I have EP whatever. EPI? I, yes. Yes. Kelsey, uh, you have everything. I literally, but, it, but it's nuts. I'm like, everything they're saying, I'm like, Sam. I know. It's uh, all it's the same. crazy. It's crazy. So it's like, treat your dog how you treat yourself. Well, we don't treat ourselves well. Treat That's ourselves the better. And then, I think it's and just going to be dog well. yeah, symbiotic. Like exactly. we got to do both. Look at Winnie. All right, guys. In the meantime, we're going to put everything in the summary. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already here on YouTube. We do this every single day. And follow yes. us at Better Together with Maria on Instagram. And we will see you next time. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.